Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Coin Brief Podcast, episode number 27. Uh, we're your hosts, Sean Wentz and Evan Faggart. We uh, cover the cryptocurrency news every week and talk about latest developments in terms of regulation, uh, investment, uh, price fluctuations, uh, new tools and financial instruments on the horizon. Um, so let's get right into the news of the past week. Um, first of all, uh, today's December 22nd. Uh, the price of Bitcoin is $330, hovering around there about. Um, and let's let's start out um, by talking about the status of Bitcoin as an investment over the past year of 2014. Uh, Some mainstream news outlets have declared Bitcoin as the worst investment of 2014 because when you look at the um, 2014 year price chart, uh, it actually started around 1,100, 1,200 almost at the beginning of the year and uh, we've reached the end of 2014 just about and it's um, lost, you know, over 50% of its value on the exchange rate. Um, Evan, you wrote a couple of articles for Bitcoinist kind of analyzing this. Um, what are what are some main points that uh, you kind of unearthed concerning this uh, price drop over 2014? Well, I, Bitcoin is the worst investment of 2014 for two main reasons. Uh, the first one, I think a lot of people or some of the people who are watching this, when when they hear me say it, they're going to roll their eyes because it happened such a long time ago. But the one main reason that makes the price uh, not very useful in determining the health of Bitcoin as a whole is Mt. Gox. Uh, and more specifically, the William Marcus bots, which were uncovered in the Willie report back in May, I guess it was. Um, now, of, of course, it's not confirmed uh, whether or not the these bots that were operating on, within the Mt. Gox exchange artificially pumped up the price if they were fraudulent or not. Ability means that there's a there's also a possibility that this entire the entire price decline of 2014 is not not really a sign of people losing interest in Bitcoin. It's just a market correction because the $1,100 price peak that happened in November of 2013 wasn't backed by any real level of demand. It's possible that it was just two bots trading back and forth but not really exchanging any money and they're just artificially pumping up the price. And so when Mt. Gox shut down, of course the whole thing you know, came crashing down. The bottom fell out of it. Yeah, so, I mean, people... I, I agree that people kind of like underestimate the effect that like Mt. Gox had um on the whole economy basically uh of of cryptocurrencies like this was the main exchange last year um it basically all the other exchanges kind of kept an eye on mount gox and their prices usually followed mount gox so of course (laughs) during the implosion of mount gox uh the other exchanges followed suit as well even though the the price on Mt. Gox had just become completely irrelevant. People weren't able to take their money out. They weren't able to withdraw anything. And, you know, that basically creates a price that is not relevant, not real, not realistic. Uh, so now, once that fraudulent activity was, is now out of the economy, this year has just been kind of like a like a resetting uh, to find the actual like market market value of Bitcoin. Yeah, the market is really, and this is this is not 100% confirmed because you know there's always a possibility that the bots were legit and that the price peak of 2013 was backed by legit demand. But I personally don't think that's the case. But of course we have to, we can't speculate too much. But if it's the case that it was just artificially pumped up by these fraudulent by this fraudulent activity happening on Gox, then yeah, the entire price decline, the entire downtrend of 2014, is really just a correction. 
it's the price is returning. It's being adjusted to um, a more realistic level of demand, and uh, so I, I personally think it could go down a little bit lower than it has. And then I, th I think regardless, um, the correction will be over by some point in early 2015. And another another thing going along with the whole the whole Gox bubble, I guess you could call it. Um, is that I, I decided to look at what the price was, what Bitcoin was going for um, in at the beginning of November, like right before the massive spike to like 800 and then 1,000. Yeah. Um, is, which is presumably because of the, the William Marcus bots. Um, and before that activity started, Bitcoin was trading for around two hundred dollars a coin so yeah. if we compare if we compare that price to what what the price is now that's actually that uh, that's actually a 60 percent growth in the Since uh that point right yeah in, in the yeah. price and so if we just isolate what happened in november and just consider that just um kind of an anomaly it was created by um, artificial demand that didn't actually exist, the Bitcoin price, the adjusted Bitcoin price actually went up during 2014. It went up by 60% approximately. Um, but again, that, you know, none of this, none of this has been definitively confirmed that it was fraudulent activity coming from Gox. But at the very least, I argue that it, sh it proves that just looking at the Bitcoin price is not enough to judge the overall health of bitcoin yeah so, not even close so this that, that brings me to the second argument or the second point i made um when looking at overall the year overall for bitcoin i i looked at the the data on growth in other areas um beyond just the bitcoin price and this this is growth in the bitcoin economy as a whole and what I did is I went to BitcoinPulse.com. They have a, a lot of great statistics about the Bitcoin economy. Um, I didn't use all of them. I, I picked the three things I picked were uh, the number of venture capitalists uh, investing in Bitcoin projects, the number of companies created, Bitcoin companies created, and the number of Bitcoin jobs created. Mm. Uh, Bitcoin Pulse does... They they do a weekly a weekly average growth for the entire year, and they do a monthly average growth for the entire year. And in both calculations, um, in both in both calculations, in all three of the the data sets that I picked out from Bitcoin Pulse, they're all really positive. Um, mm. And on yeah. top of that, I talked to. The administrator of Deep Dot Web, which is a news website dedicated to covering uh, developments in the dark net, uh, so you know, basically drugs. Because, Silk Road, Hydra, Cloud Nine. Yeah, because you know, whether we like it or not, illegal drugs play a big part in the Bitcoin economy. And one of the the guy who wrote the article that coined the phrase "Bitcoin is the worst investment of 2014." He's the government crackdowns on the dark net as a reason for the price declining because since that is such a large part of the Bitcoin economy, the government crackdowns took a large chunk of that away because people got too scared to use Bitcoin on the dark net. So mm. the demand for Bitcoin went down. That's the argument so, he uses. That's the argument he uses. But I talked to the, the administrator of Deep.Web who, for obvious reasons, you know, keeps his identity anonymous to everyone. And he has lots of connections with darknet market operators, which is how he, they are able to, his website is able to produce all the news about the darknet they do. And um, we talked about Operation Anonymous specifically because it was the most recent one. And I asked him if, if he thought it diminished the overall level of activity on the dark net at all. And he said, no, that, uh, there is only one, there was only one major marketplace that was taken down by operation anonymous. The rest of them were either spam sites or mirror sites or just like totally non-significant, insignificant markets that didn't have that much activity. Mm -hmm. So 
the other two major markets still remain fully operational. So everybody just went to those other two markets. Yeah. And he said he has the traffic data to prove that. I didn't ah, get that from him. Interesting. But I'm going to take his word for it. So basically in my article, I concluded that uh, Bitcoin is far from a bad investment in 2014, unless you're a day trader, of course, because uh, the Bitcoin economy as a whole, the mainstream or you know mainstream uh, grew economy grew, and the seedy underbelly of the Bitcoin economy, the deep web activity there, if it didn't grow, it definitely didn't diminish. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean they just they just took down Silk Road 2.0, which was everyone from the beginning of that uh, copycat site kind of was suspicious of it anyway people who were smart were suspicious of it and it did turn out to be that the administrator was an idiot and got himself caught and along with silk road 2.0 two other um semi-major marketplaces were taken down including uh cloud nine and a couple others but yeah, like there, it's still still thriving. It's still going really strong. Um, Agora is one of the main marketplaces now, which was basically untouched. People were scared for a while once these takedowns happened, but then business re- resumed as usual, and it's it's just thriving again. And uh, I guess that marketplaces, darknet market marketplaces, haven't really switched over to dark coin yet or any other anonymous altcoin. And they're basically just still sticking with Bitcoin because it works well enough for them. It's relatively easy now to stay anonymous with it just by using coin mixing services um, or HD wallets yeah, or both. Soon they'll be able to use uh, Dark Wallet. Right, right. And Dark Wallet uh, is going to see an official um, full release. So, yeah, I mean, that's still that's still going strong despite the... Uh, law enforcement agencies kind of taking Silk Road 2.0 and kind of making an, ex- an example out of that marketplace and that administrator and saying, hey, we got this big guy. We seized all this money. We're going to look at how successful we are at taking down criminals. Well, um, look at the bigger picture, and they didn't really get that much accomplished at all if their goal was to like take right. down this illegal um, economy. So that's still going. That's still going really strong, and um, uh, just I want to I want to mention something that you uh, mentioned a, a minute ago uh, about the price hike, the the bubble in late 2013. Um, even if that uh, wasn't entirely caused by the Willy bot and the fraudulent activities on Mount Gox, other factors are that. Uh, once the first Silk Road was taken down, that added some extra legitimacy to Bitcoin's image. And then once the United States Senate started hearing about it from experts uh, and actually liked the idea and were kind of receptive to it and kind of willing to not like want to ban it outright, uh, people saw the U.S. government actually respects this as a formidable payment system. Um, that added some extra legitimacy in the eyes of it as well. So people saw that and uh, kind of thought that this thing might go to like ten thousand dollars like right away and and started buying into it. At least that's kind of the sentiment that I felt late last year as I was watching this, and that's some of the sentiment that was going on in the community as well. So I mean, it's just all those factors together led to this massive price hike bubble last year and then you have you know switch over into 2014 and at that point it's at the height of the bubble and you know the only place to go from there is basically downward and that's the overall trend from this year but yeah when you look at when you look at the actual hard numbers of how the actual economy is doing how people are working to create new tools to create new jobs to create new ecosystems uh, within the cryptocurrency space, there's been a ton of growth. It's ridiculous. Um, tons of uh, journalism websites popped up, including CoinBrief, including uh, so many others. There's there's a pretty wide ecosystem of Bitcoin news now, even if not all of them are um, uh, as professional as uh, as we would expect from from like news agencies. But there's definitely been a strong explosion of, of growth and, and of jobs available and ways to make money, 
Uh, you mentioned like job boards in your article, people posting up job listings, basically like a like a Craigslist for Bitcoin payments is pretty awesome. And um, yeah, I mean, there's there's been so much growth and there's been so much growth in potential new applications for Bitcoin as well. We've seen people, uh, they're starting to develop side chains now. Blockstream has $21 million of investment for them to build side chains and potential applications for that. You could potentially put any altcoin imaginable onto the Bitcoin blockchain now using side chains. Um, so when you actually look at the hard facts about what's going on in the ecosystem, all growth, uh, not always good growth, but definitely growth in so many crazy diverse areas. Um, these web, these websites uh, who kind of run with the headline Bitcoin worst investment of 2014, they're looking at just a small sliver of the picture. And that sliver is just the 2014 price chart. That's the only thing they're yeah. looking at. They're not looking at any of the data before that. They're not looking at the actual facts on the ground in the ecosystem. If they like that same kind of argument of uh, Bitcoin is the worst investment of 2014 by looking at the one year price chart, uh, you can use that same argument to say Bitcoin is the best investment of all time when you look at the past five years. Yeah, because it's still up like over a thousand percent. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, just okay, if you want to blind yourself to the rest, you know, anything before 2014, yeah, it looks bad. But uh, okay, if we're going to talk about this as an investment vehicle which you know i i would urge people to not look at it as look at it as yeah. an investment look at it more like an experiment it's in a, technology and liberty and money well even beyond even besides that it's just a currency with a economy that's growing around it so we can't expect you know the purchasing power to be uh constant at all in any sense of the word because yeah as people come in, as people leave, you know, demand is just going to rise and fall. So. Yeah. And really just last year, people became aware of it and started figuring out what this thing is. People in the mainstream, I mean, people who just go about their daily lives, they don't pay that much attention to uprising, you know, new technologies and, and things like that. Uh, people just hear about it and it's like, Oh wow, this thing is possibly legitimate. This thing might actually be, um, a driving force in the digital economy. And that's where so much of the price fluctuation has come from in the past year is, is people trying to figure out what is this thing? Should I put money into it? Will this be uh, a, a driving force in, in the economy on the internet in the, in the coming years? So yeah, like uh, people got to look at the big picture. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, one one more thing about that before we move on is that another another piece of data that I didn't put in my article for length restriction reasons uh, was the uh, transaction volume. Uh, one one particular website was talking about how bad Bitcoin was, and they they the author the author pointed out the stag uh, the stagnation of transaction volume in 2014, and he posted the chart of 2014 of just the averages of transactions that happened and it was pretty much a straight line mm. uh if you just look at 2014 from you know january to december but if you go on i think uh what's that website called like bitcoinality or something like that it's another data site where you can get um you know, some economic data for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They have they have a year over year transaction chart that shows all five years of Bitcoin's life. Um and the the separate lines on the graph for each year, they're just stacked on top of each other like this. Just it, each year there's just insane amounts of transaction growth uh that you just that you just wouldn't see if you only looked at the one year chart. So if while you yeah transactions may have been fairly constant throughout 2014 but compared to 2013 um it's much much higher they they grew a lot mm. yeah um i i went over to bitcoinity.org and looked at their yeah that's what it is bitcoinity okay, that's what yeah. i was thinking about yeah um i looked at their two-year price chart 
And actually, like, just you don't even have to go. You don't have to go back five years. Just go back two years uh, to December 2012. And if you're if we're talking about investments and whether it's a good or a bad investment or not, uh, over the past two years, it's been a over 2,400% gain in the Bitcoin price. <laughs> Over 2,400% in the past two years. And then if you just, if you change that to just one year, just cut that time frame in half to one year and it's like minus 60%. You'll, yeah, that's what volatility looks like. <laughs> so, and this thing is not going to get any less volatile next year is my guess. It's going to stay volatile. I, think it, I actually think it will. You think it's going to kind of level out a bit? Definitely think the downtrend will... Uh, the the downtrend which is possibly a correction i think that'll end at some point in early 2015 uh-huh. um and also uh, several months ago uh like it was still warm outside so i guess it was like summer late summer early fall uh this guy posted a uh published a chart that he had made of uh bitcoin volatility he like indexed it and tracked its growth or yeah, or yeah. its uh, progress and uh, it's actually, you know, steadily declined over the last five years, and hmm. that's that's just due to the growing network effect. Uh, every everybody, for some reason, everybody, it's a popular thought these days that volatility is just some inherent characteristic of Bitcoin, and that it's just this huge problem for mainstream acceptance because nobody will ever get in on Bitcoin because of prices. Which is really weird because I haven't even been in the Bitcoin community for a year yet. But when I first started, you know, following Bitcoin, people were making fun of other people who were who were citing volatility as a reason for why Bitcoin wasn't a good currency, mm-hmm. and they were just laughing because it was so obvious that as the network effect grew, uh, volatility would decline and the price would stabilize, the purchasing power stabilized. It seems like a lot of people have forgotten that apparently over the last nine months because that's all anybody talks about now. But I think in 2015, the network effect is going to continue to grow. Um, Bitcoin, more and more people are going to get into Bitcoin, not because they see it as a get rich quick day trading scheme, um, but because they're genuinely interested in the technology uh, or they certain mainstream economic events may push more people into Bitcoin for whatever reason, mm. uh, I think more people are going to start using Bitcoin and buying it in 2015. And that's going to increase the network effect, which, and also of course, maybe increase the price as well. Maybe, but if it doesn't do that, it will at the very least decrease volatility, which is what I'm getting at. Mm. As the network effect of a currency increases, uh, the purchasing power tends to. It it doesn't. It's not as effective affected as severely by individual transactions because the network effect is just so large that there are so many people participating in it. It just creates, um, you know, steadily declining volatility and there's, you know, empirical data to show that. So wouldn't it be a little bit disappointing though, if the volatility subsided and the price kind of just stabilized around like $400, let's say the price just stays flat at 400. Wouldn't like, we were kind of hoping that the price would stabilize a little bit closer to like 1000 at least or or 2000 I, I was hoping it would stabilize somewhere around a million personally but <laughs> yeah. but yeah. no i don't think it'll be it'll be boring for the you know hardcore uh hodlers out there who are who are like yeah i'm well, i'm holding on to my bitcoin hoard for the next uh 50 years i don't care how high or low the price gets but as far as everyone else is concerned who are actually buying and selling it daily, using it in transactions, daily transactions, I don't I don't think it'll be sad. I think a lot of people will celebrate that and it'll prove a lot of these naysayers wrong. And also people are looking for a stable Bitcoin price, uh, so much so that there are actually entrepreneurs, which we're getting ready to talk about, who are creating altcoins with the sole purpose of manipulating the supply to keep the purchasing power stable. Mm -hmm. And there's also been a lot of more technical research done on this. 
a paper about this scheme called seniorage scare or shares, which I, I won't get into that because it's kind of related, but not really. So I don't want to, you know, get off on too much of a tangent, but, there, but there's people who are trying to figure out how are we going to stabilize cryptocurrency prices? Because for whatever reason, they believe Bitcoin will be volatile forever and it's, it's going to be the death of Bitcoin. But I, so I think if the price does end up or the volatility does end up subsiding and we, you know, get a flat purchasing power of, of somewhere like 350 or 400, I don't, I don't think the people, I don't think people in the mainstream will be like, Oh man, that really sucks. You know, we wanted the roller coaster ride because yeah. the roller coaster ride is what they're saying makes it completely unattractive. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess. I mean, there, I, I kind of agree with that because, uh, like, some people say that once we get regulation of virtual currencies and cryptocurrencies, it'll be more legitimate once we have lic the bit license to uh, license these exchanges and stuff like that. And then the consumer will be more inclined to get into it. Well, if, if people really are scared of the volatility itself, um, no amount of government regulation is going to change the fact that uh, a particular asset is a certain value one day and then it's a certain value another day based on how many people want it and how many people don't want it as much anymore so it's it's either from a government pers perspective or a business perspective that wants to like kind of create artificial demand to level out a price or something it's hard to control those market forces because it's hard to control how much people are willing to pay for something at a certain time you know well that goes back to the network effect if we get regulatory clarity which i personally think is as much as i hate regulation i think regulatory clarity in any direction positive or negative i th i think that will lead to a, a decrease in volatility because because it will it, it might not make it more legitimate, but it will make it less risky as far as uh, the legality of it is concerned. I think there are a lot of big businesses who might be interested in partially or fully integrating Bitcoin into their into their business model, but the government could ban it at any second. It's just not worth the risk of doing it because they could expend all these re resources into integrating it. And then tomorrow it could be banned and they have to spend just as much resources hmm. forcing all that work that they did. Hmm. So I think regulatory clarity will get more big business in, which will then increase that network effect we were just talking about, which will lead to you know, a decrease in volatility. All right. Um, so speaking of regulation, I'll mention the fact that we got some additional clarity, I guess, based on uh, what Ben, Lo uh, Superintendent Ben Lasky of the New York Department of Financial Services came out and uh, clarified the new revisions of the New York bit license, the license for companies that want to deal in cryptocurrencies. Uh, they actually loosened the rules a little bit which is kind of what we and a lot of people in the community expect to happen. Uh, they loosened the rules a little bit. Uh, some examples of what they loosened was instead of having to get the personal information and addresses and phone numbers of literally everyone who's even tangentially associated with your customers of your business, um, instead of getting the KYC of people who are just two degrees separated from your customers, you only have to get that information from the customers themselves or the consumers themselves. So if you're like, if you are like Coinbase type entity or TrueCoin type entity and you're selling Bitcoin to people, you only have to get the information of the people you're selling it to. You don't have to get the information of the people who receive the Bitcoin from your consumer who bought it from you in the first place. Because that was what the original bit license would have mandated happen and right. that's completely unreasonable for businesses to try and collect the like you're basically telling businesses to be the, this NSA style surveillance apparatus and keep track of these people that are barely like tangentially related so that's completely unreasonable that's stricken from the bit license which makes all the sense in the world and that's good 
Um, another thing is they only have to store the information for seven years as opposed to 10 years, which is a modest improvement, but still kind of absurd that those records are going to be on file for seven years. But hey, it's better than 10, I suppose. Um, another thing is they clarified who will be exempt from the bit license and who will not have to apply, which is software makers, uh, merchants who accept payments in the currency, uh, people who just buy it for holding or investing or whatever they want to do, um, miners who maintain the blockchain and earn cryptocurrency uh, as it's created. They're exempt as well. Uh, basically just um, exchanges who hold on to people's dollars and coins as they like trade them between each other and between other virtual currencies and um, merchants themselves who sell Bitcoin directly to consumers like uh, Coinbase or TrueCoin. Um, basically those types of people who are basically just holding people's money for them uh, that's the type of entities that Ben Lasky claims he wants to regulate the most. Those are the people who he wants to prevent from just disappearing into a black hole, so to speak, with people's money. Um, so yeah, uh, I mean, pretty pretty good revisions. Uh, like, it's much better than the original. Um, supposedly, it's pretty clear now who it's not going to apply to. Um, and and yeah, I mean it's it's overall positive rev revisions, and this may be like the best uh, possible bit license that we're gonna get out of New York. Basically, it's the best that we could hope for. I hope not. You it's, hope not. It's a, it's a small step in the right direction. Sure, you can't. Nobody can deny that. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. I mean. I mean, will this provide like a more? clarity for businesses at least the ones that are operating out of new york oh yeah definitely that goes back to what i said about regulatory clarity it's it's clarification regardless of whether or not it's good or bad clarification it's still a certain this is what we're this is our stance on bitcoin this is what we're going to do but that's that's still kind of a a broad perspective to look at it and because and and that applies to you know trying to fi figuring out how we're going to decrease the, the price volatility regulatory clarity is one of those factors but the regulations itself they still suck mm -hmm. they still suck really bad yeah I mean, okay so let, let me go into some other parts as well like one thing that's still in there that does actually you're right it kind of sucks still is um these businesses that that uh will still have to apply for the bit license, they still have to hire dedicated um, security engineers, cybersecurity engineers, to maintain the security of the exchange or website. Um, even if they're like a brand new uh, startup who doesn't necessarily have the money to do that. Now, one good change they did, did implement is that new startups, if they don't have the money to do all these regulations and comply and everything, they'll be able to apply for a two-year provisional license, which I guess means that they'll be on the record as saying, we're trying to comply, we want the bit license, uh, we're above board, we're legitimate, but for potentially two years, we don't have to necessarily uh, comply with every aspect of the bit license as we are just a startup that's trying to get off the ground and we don't have a lot of money for hiring you know, uh, regulation uh, mandated employees basically who cost a lot of money to employ. So it's, it's, it's really a, like a double edged sword. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of more leeway that's been granted to these businesses, but yeah, they still have to comply with costly things. Like at least within two years, they've got to hire a security engineer to maintain that. Yeah, it's, it's not as restrictive, but all of the same economic arguments that we that we made about the first one still applies. Mm. the The same the the intensity of the regulation doesn't change the quality of the regulation. 
uh, if, if that makes sense. It's a difference of degree, but not of kind. Mm -hmm. So all the, all the same effects are still going to be, are still going to take place. It's still going to, uh, make it really hard for exchanges to, to be established in New York and, uh, and compete with the existing exchanges. It's still a massive violation of privacy for the customers of those exchanges because they have to give up all their inf all their data. Mm. Uh, or do the customers do that, or is it just the exchanges? Well, b by this regulation, businesses that um, are based out of New York or even just have customers in New York will have to get that information from them. They'll have to ask for that information what's your name where do you live what's your phone number right and um like i guess if people don't want to do that and don't want to give up their privacy basically you know there's still other options on the market that they can keep in mind instead of buying from coinbase who might request in your information uh, according to new york to new york law you could still just go on localbitcoins.com and set up a cash transaction with someone in your local area who won't give a shit about your name or your address and shouldn't ask for it and won't be able to. So people will just have to be educated about uh, which services are regulatory compliant and might kind of give up a little bit of their privacy and which ones aren't as compliant and a little bit uh, under, you know, under the board a little bit and uh, use those instead if they're concerned about those issues. Yeah, they they can they can still do that. That's that's always been an option. Local bitcoins and any other service like that that might come yeah. out is always going to be. Mycelium Wallet has a has a local yeah, they, trader feature. They, yep. They those those will always be options that people can use to get around restrictive legislation, but. The, the the fact of the matter is that there's still restrictive legislation coming out and it it's always going to suck but and we and we should always we, as long as as long as we're permitted to as long as they let us uh, give them our opinions on it we should always say hey any kind of regulation like this sucks you should just leave it alone uh for a while or at least don't be nearly as hard as you're being right now even this improved version is still very restrictive mm. and and we and we can still do that because there's going to be a second commenting period but yeah which has still, which has started by the way there's 30 days to comments on the revised bit license and then starting in late January of 2015 uh it's it's going to become official, and then you'll have New York businesses will have to start to comply, right? And but still, it's it's going to be really bad for New York, and I I think it's going to really slow down the growth of the Bitcoin economy in New York just because of how restrictive the it still is, mm. and uh, like as far as privacy is concerned, it it loosened up a little bit. Um, on privacy, but economically, the like I said just a minute ago, economically, all the effects are still going to be the 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 same, even if they if, even if they might not be as severe. Mm. But it's, it's still it's still regulatory clarity, so it still might contribute to to decreasing the price volatility in 2015. So even even though I just absolutely can't stand what's actually in the regulation it just you know makes me sick to my stomach uh, it's still it still might contribute to some some positive changes in the bitcoin price at least and until we we can accept that and be thankful for that and still tell you know Ben Lawski and just you know national governments too that you know, hey, we just we need to keep the market free because it's there's no reason to restrict it like this. It's gonna it it basically regulates itself. We found that out with the exchanges, what they did following Mt. Gox, all kinds of stuff that have happened in the Bitcoin community that have proven the free markets work. But mm -hmm. like I said, we need regulatory clarity because the big guy the big dogs aren't gonna get in until the government does take uh very 
decisive stance on Bitcoin. Hopefully, it'll be more positive than negative, and maybe we can influence that. Probably not, but it's going to happen regardless, and regulatory yeah. clarity is it's, it's good even if the actual regulation is bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I agree that uh, at some point we're going to see just uh, comprehensive regulation across the board, probably across the whole country of America. They're going to adopt some sort of virtual currency regulation that'll probably look similar to the bit license, maybe even a little bit more leeway if people keep pushing back against the restrictive aspects of it. Uh, but like, there's this schism happening um, where you have the people who advocate for the legitimacy of Bitcoin and advocate for the regulation of it, uh, lobbying governments for uh, approval of it and favorable regulation. But then at the same time, you still have this very successful, very thriving underground economy where things are still totally free. They don't give a damn about any of these potential regulations, whether they're official or proposed or whatever. Uh, they just keep keep on trucking doing what they're doing uh, they don't care about these regulations like as we mentioned darknet marketplaces are thriving um, the very first decentralized online marketplace open bazaar is still in development it's being built there's people selling stuff on there already um, next year it'll probably be a, a very um, solid uh, platform uh, that's easy to use to sell or buy anything you want with Bitcoin, uh, and no one can take it down, whether they're complying with regulations or not. So, like, we can almost like have our cake and eat it too, in a way. Like, we can have the legitimacy of regulations, uh, kind of stabilizing the price, stabilizing public perception of it, increasing consumer confidence, as Ben Lasky kind of frames it. And then at the same time, if you want to dive into the hard and gritty, like freedom, total freedom, anarchy, do whatever you want with your money and no one can tell you not to uh, and have any level of privacy you want to, uh, if you have the technical chops to accomplish it, um, you can do that as well and not care about regulations at all. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the ne into next year of this kind of duality happening in the virtual currency space. Definitely. There's there's always been workarounds to restrictions to the free market and there there always will be and cryptocurrency makes those workarounds a lot easier. Yeah. And uh the more the the harder the government works to restrict something, the the more creative people get and and getting around those regulations. So if if the regulation that starts to be proposed and implemented by higher levels of government, like state and state and national government, uh, if it if it follows Ben Lost and New York's lead, if it follows those guys, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty bad. It's gonna be pretty restrictive, but there's there's always gonna be a way around it, and I think depend i think the level of restrictiveness of the, the the legislation that comes out in 2015 is going to determine how many people move to the more underground side of the bitcoin economy yeah um so speaking of the underground side of the economy especially as it was last year uh, uh bitcoin entrepreneur charlie shrem has been sentenced to two years in prison uh, just last week, he was sentenced, uh, and he has to serve that sentence of two years for what he did last year um, concerning his company, BitInstant, which was a Bitcoin exchange, and how he basically uh, used that as a platform for selling Bitcoin to people who would then go on to spend the Bitcoin um, on Silk Road to buy drugs on that darknet marketplace. And authorities uh, claimed and were apparently able to prove in court that he knew that people were going to use that Bitcoin uh, to spend on Silk Road and that he was in affiliation with someone by the moniker of BTC King, a uh, real name Robert Fiella, uh, who operated a, like a, 
uh, Silk Road kind of uh, store kind of thing for exchanging Bitcoin as well. And um, so yeah, Charlie Shrem basically uh, uh, being hung out to dry as a as a martyr almost by the U.S. law enforcement. Um, yeah, were were you what what was what's your reaction to the to the two year sentence? I personally had hoped that he would kind of get off without having to sit behind bars uh, for any time, but um, I guess that was kind of a idealistic hope. Uh, they're really going after him. He apparently made millions doing this, um, and uh, they're they're really going after him for this. I actually agree with Charlie Shrem on this. After after he was sentenced, he he tweeted about it and he said that he was just sentenced to two years in prison. But he but then he said, considering that I was facing thirty years, I think justice has been served. Uh, I I agree with that. I I think I think that three years is definitely is definitely reasonable it should be zero years you know we've we've talked about this before on um a previous show that the the crime that he was accused of and was convicted of and now has been sentenced is it, it's money laundering and it's really it really is only a crime because of things being illegal when they shouldn't be illegal. Right. Th- things things like marijuana and other certain other illegal substances that just really there's no reason why they should be illegal and money laundering comes from the fact that these things are illegal so the the people who participate in that illicit business have to hide where their revenue comes from. So naturally because they, they're looking out for their own yeah. safety basically. So I don't I don't think money laundering in itself is really a crime it's it's certainly a victimless crime at any rate but yeah. I don't I don't think it should be a crime at all legal in a, in a legal sense I don't because ev- everything that encourages people to launder money mostly comes from things that shouldn't be illegal in the first place so but but the fact that money laundering is considered such a serious crime in the United States and that people are uh, prosecuted so harshly for it, yeah. I, I think it's a big win for Charlie that he only got three years instead of the rest of his life because he'll be like 50 or – if he got the full 30-year sentence, he'd be like 50 or 60 when he got out. That's his That'd whole life horrible. is over. Yeah. Yeah. So – He'll he'll serve three years. He's two years. Two years. Two years. Two years. He's got to do three years of probation after he gets out, and then and then he'll be back at it. He'll be helping people in the Bitcoin world. He'll be helping spread awareness, and hopefully he'll be allowed to start a new business. And it uh, he won't participate in money laundering this time. Hopefully next time. Yeah, he he actually tried to make the argument in court that uh, he would, like, if if he got off without a prison sentence, he would, like, use his time to try and educate the community uh, in order to not do money laundering and try and be, like, a a, a good, a force for good in the Bitcoin community. Um, But the judge didn't buy it. They were like, no, no, if you go out there again, you'll probably just start doing the same thing again. (laughs) You need a substantial prison sentence. Yeah. yeah. So after after this news came out, um, a lot of people started comparing this case to the high profile example of HSBC, the large corporate bank, uh, laundering billions upon billions of dollars uh, for drug cartels and using their their own banking systems to help out these terribly violent organizations that um, get rich off of drugs and basically take over territories by use of force and killing people and uh, after that after that came to light it was HSBC basically admitted that they did it they were they were able to just dismiss the charges by coming to a 1.9 billion dollar deal with the US government to drop those charges and uh, to put that in, in perspective uh 
HSBC made a profit in 2013, not revenues, but a profit of $16 billion. So $1.9 billion, that's, uh, that's a little over 10% of their profits that they had to just kind of fork out in order to avoid anyone in their organization going to jail. No one had to go to jail uh, for that. And um, then Charlie Shrem gets two years in prison just for uh, helping out some drug users to, uh, to buy drugs peacefully from peaceful sellers through the internet and not harming anyone at all, not chopping off any heads and putting them on stakes or anything. Um, yeah, it's, it's a weird justice system that we have, definitely. That is just such a double standard. Uh, it's so crazy, especially considering how incredibly terrified we are of those extremist groups. Yeah. Like terrorism, the, the fear we have of terrorism is 10 times worse than the fear we had of communism back in the 50s and 60s. Ah, those are like, the days. Like, like this this fear of terrorism is is just is so much worse the red scare is nothing compared to this and we we let the bank off with a slap on the wrist yeah. simply because why it's too big to fail is that the the excuse again oh yeah if you jail <laughs> anyone from that company then the whole economy is fucked yeah. that's the argument they use it's just it's so ridiculous how much of a double standard there is our the, the federal government was they they let terrorist financers get off with a slap on the wrist but they just attempted to put not the federal government but a different level of government just attempted to put somebody in prison for 30 years basically because they use the technology that they don't like and a reason that they don't like mm. it is that it may aid in financing terrorism that it's just how so... dare he sit behind a computer and enable financial <laughs> transactions for peaceful people how dare he it's just so but uh, another thing that i think might be interesting to talk about it's kind of related to the charlie shrimp case is a new development that happened with ross ulbrich's case Mm. The uh, the court just uh, they banned Ross Ulbricht's defense team from bringing up Ross's political uh, beliefs in court because they're worried that it might encourage jury nullification and that Ross Ulbricht might go f might go free because the jury wouldn't want to convict him due to. Uh, political beliefs that might encourage them to exercise their constitutional rights. Really? Yep. So, so wait, so part of the jury was, was dismissed because, because no, like no, some no, of them no. might, might agree with Ross Ulbricht or, or how did that work? No, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the jury. Um, although that does, that does happen. If, if you, if you get selected for jury duty, if you get drawn for jury duty and you have mm. to go in uh, during the jury selection, if you bring up jury nullification uh, at all, you will immediately get struck from the jury and you won't have to serve on the jury. That's just that's say how much, the words jury nullification. Yep, that that's how much they hate it. Uh, <laughs> even though that. it is, even though it is a constitutionally protected right, they just hate it so much that they'll just dismiss anybody who even knows about it. Mm. But. But what happened in, in Ross Ulbricht's case was that the defense team was going to bring up his political beliefs regarding the drug war and the fact that Ross believed that drugs should be legalized because it's a freedom of choice thing. And the court was worried that that might incite a jury nullification ruling in, in which the jury let lets him go because they agree and they decide not to convict him based on the fact that they disagree with the drug laws that he's being tried for. Wow. So they the court 
banned his defense team from bringing those political beliefs up during during the trial so that wouldn't happen wow so, so this this case is highly politicized it seems like yeah they're they're basically just it's just another in, instance of them of the of the court stacking the odds against ross any yeah. any any chance he might have of getting off on this or getting uh, getting away with this, being found not guilty, is they're just eliminating all chances of that. They're they're going to convict him no matter what, and they're they not, decided basically that he's yeah, going down. At, at this point, at this point, they've you know they've they've banned free speech in, in a public area. So at this point, they're not even trying to hide the fact that they've already made the decision to convict him. Right now, they're they're just tying up any loose ends that might produce an unexpected result. They're they're just locking in what they already want to happen. That, yeah, that's all that's going on. And apparently, they they wouldn't really they didn't want to release um, uh, extra evidence that they had against him, even though they're kind of supposed to as part of the discovery process. And uh, Ross Ulbricht's lawyer uh, kind of came out against that. He was he was kind of angry about that that like they aren't really going to even get to see all of the evidence until the trial itself. So they're just going to kind of go in there kind of blind almost to what they have to face off against. And uh yeah, it's just it's just stacked against him. They decided that he's going down. He uh he's going to be in prison for a very long time and um he's he like if he's if he really did run Silk Road, like he's he's the guy that they want to put out get his head on a stake, be like, this. we caught this guy, uh, we took down that evil drug marketplace. Um, it's unfortunate for him personally, but it's it's still amazing to think about that, even despite the fact that they got him and took down Silk Road twice now, um, the darknet market is still thriving and very healthy. Yeah. There was something else the court did. I can't remember exactly what it was, but they, the the court kept some certain piece of information from being released uh to you know the general public or or to the defense team or whatever i can't remember exactly what but their reasoning behind it was that they were afraid that ross ulbricht would use his dark net connections to have the people connected to that information assassinated so they so they decided yeah. to keep that information out of the court <laughs> and yeah. and they of course announced that publicly to you know further uh, the, they want to continue the, even, yeah, yeah. the narrative character assassination like this yeah. guy is a assassin he's <laughs> hires people to get to, to murder his enemies and stuff like that even though like they originally tried to charge him with the murder for hire thing but eventually they they, they eventually dropped that charge because there's just not enough evidence for that and there's a good chance that the fbi the fbi actually kind of fabricated that aspect of the story when they initially arrested him. Um, there's there's no solid evidence that he tried to hire anyone to murder someone else, but they want to continue that narrative to make him seem like a seem like a drug cartel guy, basically. This evil drug lord who, you know, hires hitmen to keep control of his territory. When that's actually what the cartels themselves are guilty of doing constantly and the people who yeah. launder their money. For yeah. And, big and we sell them guns and we sell them guns so they can continue doing that. Yeah. That too. I forgot about that. But <laughs> Ross Ulbricht at this point is just, he, he's more of a political figure than a criminal. Like the, in, the entire libertarian community has rallied around him because of course they're all about ending the drug war. So this is, it's it's no longer about figuring out whether or not this this guy did something that he wasn't supposed to. It's it's just asserting dominance over some like growing political movement that values individual liberty. Because mm -hmm. Ross Fulbert has come has become somewhat of a mascot, and so that just makes them want to you know cut his head off and put it on a stake even more. Because it it's it will just be a huge demoralizing uh, move yeah. for anyone who supports ending the drug war. Because this major anti-drug war hero is now being thrown in prison for the rest of his life, and that's what it's what this has become. Yeah. Well, dominance. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're gonna do whatever they can to put him away for the rest of his life.
Yeah, hit it on the spot right there. Totally true. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see what happens with that with that uh, trial as it starts next month. Um, let's pivot a little bit to a different topic. Let's talk about change tip and the whole micro tipping frenzy that went viral in the past couple months. Um, change tip has actually drawn some criticism recently uh, from a couple of high profile people. Uh, most notably, I'm going to mispronounce his name for sure. Eamon Gun Sarir. Yeah. Uh, he's basically <laughs> a hacker and professor at Cornell university. And, um, he's a big computer nerd. He's really, um, has expertise on, uh, computer science and everything like that. And he's pretty involved with Bitcoin as well, but he came out with a pretty lengthy article on hacking distributed.com where he talked about change tip, the micro tipping, uh, platform and had a lot of criticism, like criticism against it. And, um, it's an interesting article. I think it's worth reading, um, for most people, but, uh, I want to go through a few of his main points and talk about the ones that I agree with and the ones that I disagree with. Um, so first of all, the ones that I agree with, uh, he says that change tip is kind of spammy in his current iteration. Uh, people using change tip on reddit.com basically leave a comment uh, on someone, someone else's post or someone else's other comment and then tag the change tip user um, username and the bot basically transfers the money and then makes another comment saying how much money was transferred. Here's the bits that you received. It's in your wallet. Click here to collect it. And then when a lot of people do this in a single thread and uh, the bot makes multiple comments verifying the transfer of the tip, it can seem spammy in those threads uh, as people are just tossing around basically pennies to other users. And then kind of the same thing on Twitter. Um, the change tip bot on Twitter makes a dedicated post every time someone um, sends money to someone over Twitter. And... Um, that's that's a criticism right now because it does seem spammy in when people are trying to have a dedicated conversation about something on Reddit or Twitter. Uh, but that's just a criticism right now. That's because they haven't implemented something yet that uh, can just seamlessly transfer the tip without making an extra comment. And you can when you when you make the tip, you can specify um, right after you say the tip, write out the word private. And that makes it so, the, so that the change tip bot doesn't make an extra comment verifying the tip. So uh, it's just your own comment that's saying the tip. So that's not a, not enough people use that. I think more people should use that. So it's not as spammy. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of a valid criticism right now because it does seem a little bit spammy as people are just throwing cents around those dedicated comments to it. Uh, you want to comment on that on that point? I agree with that. But on the other hand, I think the public nature of change tip, the fact that everybody can see the tipping going on, it is part of what made change tip so big, which in turn contributed to a, uh, an undeniable growth in Bitcoin awareness because there were lots of people who came to the Bitcoin subreddit saying, hey, I just got, I just got tipped. Uh, some Bitcoin through change tip like what is this is this real money how do I get involved in this community so you definitely have to give change tip credit for spreading awareness but mm -hmm. but yeah it does I guess it does make it look kind of spammy it is kind of annoying sometimes to see like a 100 a 100 comment long chain of people just tipping each other back and forth right um, but like you said that's that's something that can definitely be fixed. It might even be an easy fix. I don't know. I don't know anything about that kind of stuff, but it it's something that change tip could definitely fix and make it kind of, you know, less intrusive, I guess you could say. Yeah. And, um, another decent point that he made in my opinion is, uh, he brought, he brought up the example of someone who tipped three cents to someone else on Reddit who had, uh, talked about, um, they lost their dad. Their dad died uh, to cancer. And um, they talked about how that experience was for them and, and how like um, 
th their dad, they actually converted their dad into believing in Bitcoin kind of before he died. Um, so assuming that story is true, it's kind of a heartfelt, um, interesting story. But then someone commented and sent them like a, a hundred bit tip, which is three cents. Um, so like... <laughs> Uh, some think that that's like really insulting and offensive that you would give three cents to someone whose dad died, and uh, I. It's it's tough. It's controversial for sure. Like, is that? Do you think that's offensive and, and insulting? It de it depends on who it is. Mm -hmm. One one person might. One mer one person might get that that tip and. It might be something really personal and sentimental to them because, like you said, that that person's grandpa was like a recent Bitcoin convert or something. They they just became convinced that Bitcoin was a good technology, yeah. and the fact that people are using Bitcoin to pay their respects to this person's grandpa, regardless of the amount, depend depending on the the person's the the original poster's. Uh, outlook on things uh, he might he might take it as like a, a really great sign of of respect and people uh giving their condolences but also it could just as easily be seen as an insult like oh my grandpa's only worth three cents mm -hmm. if if you're the type of person who who judges things in that in that kind of way right. who you know but that that's not the case for everybody. It, it's not. That's not some objective rule that tipping three cents to somebody is universally offensive. Yeah, and that's it, kind of the it, argument that he's making in that article. Like, why would you yeah. tip three cents to anyone if you wouldn't if you wouldn't pick up that amount off the ground? Why would you send it over the internet to someone? Um, but yeah, I would say like it's much easier to collect money that way over the internet through change tip than having to bend over and physically expend energy to pick up that money off the ground or and then put it in your pocket and it's jangling around in your pocket. Um, it's Tipping is so much better through the internet in general. Yeah, I think it, it's it's a case-by-case -case basis. It, it's just on who, whoever's, whoever's receiving the tip, it just depends on how they perceive it. Like, mm -hmm. like I personally wouldn't really pay as much attention to the amount being sent to me as I would uh as i would pay attention to the j the kind gesture that's being yeah. directed towards and being me. grateful like, that someone yeah, like, actually sent you some amount of money for free yeah like like oh this this guy actually cares about my grandpa and i don't even know him he's on the internet but he cares enough to show this kind gesture to me that's that's how i would take it yeah but but then on the other hand it's not always 3 cents like when when the whole change tip thing first got super viral when it first blew up, I guess this was about a month or two ago now. There was this this thread on some subreddit I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it, it's a thread devoted to sharing tips on eating cheap, uh, cheap meals you can make, mm. you know, uh, cheap brands and things like that. And this guy made a thread. He's he lost his job. He's got a he's got a kid. And he has to eat cheap for the next week or so until he can get a new job and have income again. Mm. And so people were giving him tips of cheap meals he can make that made a lot of food in the last whole week. Just sympathizing with him and using change tip to give him small amounts of Bitcoin. And it just it turned into this big chain of tipping and eventually the guy got like a thousand one or two thousand dollars out of it and not only was he able to eat for the next week until he got a new job but he paid for his son's christmas or he was he had enough to pay for his son's christmas and i think he said he was going to yeah. so it, it's not always these little minuscule amounts sometimes it makes a huge difference yeah and like if someone uh kind of goes public with something like that where they're like, hey, I just lost my job. I need to support uh, my family. I, you know, I could use some help, you know, getting back up on my feet. Well, now there's like a whole um, ecosystem that they can kind of tap into. And if people are receptive to their needs and feel that that's a legitimate uh, person to like help out a little bit, like, you know, even a few cents 
if like a hundred people give like five cents each, that's already five dollars. That's you know you can buy a gallon of milk with that and have some left over to buy a gallon of gas as well with the current gas prices. So like, <laughs> you know, a little tips can um, add up to be a lot. And yeah, uh, I going into some of these this this guy's other other points on hacking distributed. Uh, he has this clickbait title: "Change Tip Must Die." Uh, basically because he says it's a centralized service and and because it's centralized and they basically are holding people's money for them um, like they're destined to to fail basically um, and the fact that like they they received um, a large amount of investment millions of dollars and they don't have um, uh, a clear plan for profit yet uh, their their plan to make money off of this is basically taking one percent off of people's withdrawals from as they withdraw from the change tip system into their uh, local wallets, and but that plan has been delayed till July of next year, so they're not even collecting any money at all from users for this yet. So this guy, the article, he's like, well, how are they gonna profit from this once they start charging this uh, this money from withdrawals? People are gonna stop using it. And um, you know, those are those are some decent points. Like, I don't see this being really profitable. Uh, but like, that's not really the point. That's not the point of this. The point is just to enable people to uh send money over social media in ways that they weren't able to before. Uh, he also brings up the point that uh, it kind of reduces privacy because people have to connect multiple social media accounts. Uh, to their change tip account, and then the, it allows change tip to see uh, which of your social media accounts are connected to you and connect your like your Reddit account to your Twitter Twitter account. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the price you pay for being able to transact actual money across these social networks, which was which was just plain not possible before. So I mean, he brings up the legitimate downsides. But to say that it's going to result in the death of change tip is just that's just pure hyperbole, uh, and it kind of misses the point of their overall system, in, in my opinion. I I think, well, the, this this section of his argument is the part I agreed most with. Uh, I don't I don't know if it's this article in particular, but it it may have been another article I read about change tip. Uh, but it's it's a centralized service and it works through off-chain transactions. It doesn't the transaction doesn't get transmitted to the blockchain until money leaves your change tip address into an actual Bitcoin address. Mm -hmm. So all the money is sitting in the centralized wallets and you really as long as your money is in your change tip wallet you don't have full ownership over it so they could easily dis disappear run off with your money or they could go out of business and you lose your money and that's one thing the privacy thing i don't really it's it's social media okay so everybody's social media accounts are going to be connected to each other because you only have one name, right? So all of your social media accounts are going to have the same name. That's how it is for me. Mm. So the, I don't really understand that argument because they're already connected because I'm one person. I'm the same person on all my social media accounts. Mm -hmm. But then the profitability aspect is because they don't currently have a, a, uh, a monetization scheme or a profitability scheme so as as the user base grows the more expensive it gets to run this to run the service and the harder it'll be to do it without a revenue stream so i i agree with that that if it goes on too long without being monetized that it'll definitely collapse because it'll just become too big to run out of pocket hmm so the, yeah. I I definitely agree with that part of the argument, but the the privacy thing not so much, because social media is just it's not private by nature, mm. <laughs> because it's social media. Yeah. And, and if you uh, if you kind of have a Reddit account that you don't want to associate with like your real name, or your real Twitter handle, um, then you would just 
hopefully be aware enough to not connect that to your yeah. change tip account, which is also connected to your real life, yeah. like YouTube and Twitter and things just, like that. Just make a separate account. It's, right. It's pretty simple. And then there's the, the, uh, the risky aspect of it where, where all the money is centralized under control of change tip. Uh, I, like I said, I don't know if that's this article or another one that I read, but I, I agree with that. But there's also nothing inherently bad about that either. It's risky, of course, but people can use private companies if they want to. That it's a free market. They, I, I actually think it was a separate article because the person who wrote, wrote this article said the whole point of Bitcoin is to decentralize everything to remove risks like this. Kind of, mm -hmm. but the the really the main idea of Bitcoin was to remove the central issuing organization or entity that has monopol monopolistic control over the supply that's what's supposed to be decentralized by bitcoin it in no way is supposed to inevitably dispose of centralized companies that might come later down the road because of the blockchain technology yeah but bitcoin itself is just a currency it's not a business model yeah yeah. I mean, in the in the future, within a couple of years, there might be a, a change tip like service that is completely and fully decentralized, where you don't have to trust them to hold your bitcoins on a centralized server, and you'll just be able to do that directly out of like a um, an application that that handles the blockchain directly. But we don't have that yet. No one's built that yet. But someone has built change tip, <laughs> and it works pretty well for now. So. Uh, yeah, these are legitimate like downsides, but it's just because the system is still imperfect and it's still so young and still um, immature. Basically, these decentralization, like hardcore, like everything must de be decentralized. Yeah. Like that's a decent ideal to strive towards, but we're far from actually achieving that reality. And we don't need to bag on companies that are still centralized because that's the only uh way to go right now it's the only available option that and that total decentralization might not be the most economically beneficial business model mm. also that's that's a i think a valid argument but back back to what i was saying like my my point is that bitcoin in in no way is supposed to keep people from voluntarily giving their money to any organization they choose. It, it doesn't matter whether they're centralized or not. The, the whole idea of Bitcoin was to actually give people the freedom to do things like that. The sole owners and have sole control over their money and they can do whatever they want with it, including taking risks with it. So I don't I don't like that argument that I read in another article that says well change tip is bad because it's not decentralized and it's not total full out crypto anarchy so it's got to hmm. go it's hmm, yeah. just I think that's a little extreme destroy it so we can have nothing instead <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I think I think that's a little extreme so the last thing I want to bring up about this guy's article is the most stupid point in my opinion is where he <laughs> makes up these this. bunch of random rules against what people should and shouldn't use tips to tip <laughs> certain people for and he's he's like do not tip people who work out of love or passion what we should only tip people who work out of misery and anger <laughs> <laughs> and he's like don't tip judges doctors nurses emts cops in fact any kind of professional of any kind outside the service sector. So like, okay, so in the previous decades, we traditionally only tipped uh, waiters and, and servers and street musicians. Therefore, those are the only people we should tip in the new digital economy. What kind of argument is that? Why can't, <laughs> just tip anyone you want. What, why do, are we gonna like discriminate discriminate against certain professions and say that they shouldn't receive digital money tips over the internet? Like why? What that's yeah, so arbitrary. I, I especially like the the rule where you can't t tip people who are doing what they're doing out of love or passion. I'm I'm guessing he he thinks that would be an insult to them because they're doing it for the sake of doing it, not to get paid. Uh -huh. But 
I I like that because it it makes me want to ask the question. Well, if if I enjoy my job, does that mean I shouldn't get a wage for it? I should be working for free. Yeah. That that's that's the kind of that's the kind of inconsistencies these sort of rules for tipping have. You don't deserve because... any money that people are willing to give you over the internet. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's pretty ridiculous. All of these, really, all of these are the um tip rule number three for tipping the very last part of it is please 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 don't tip oprah and bill gates <laughs> yeah what is what is even the point of that it doesn't it doesn't matter who people tip it's their money they can do what they want to with it and they can tip whoever they want if they appreciate what that yeah. person is doing i can kind of understand the argument that like it's kind of pointless to tip those people because they're already rich and so high profile where like they aren't even going to pay attention to a $5 tip or even really a $10 tip uh, through change tip. Like it's not, they're just going to be like, wait, someone tried to send me like some kind of virtual money over, over social media. I'm already a billionaire. I don't care that much. So yeah, I don't think that would make that much like of a, of a dent in, in like, in spreading Bitcoin awareness, but like saying that you definitely shouldn't do it. Uh, wh why? Why? Don't set arbitrary yeah, you, restrictions for people. You don't even, you wouldn't even lose anything from that because even, even if they didn't care about that, that small insignificant tip, it's not like it's gone forever. If they don't accept it, then you get it back. Yeah. So and and yeah. who who's to say they wouldn't appreciate a five or ten dollar tip? Like, does does being rich and successful exempt people from the desire of being appreciated? Like, yeah. if if you're if you're rich and successful and famous, do you not crave appreciation anymore? And it's just totally doesn't. Job, I'm a really big fan. I think I think that's totally ridiculous. You should I think you should tip somebody if you like what they're doing regardless of whether or not they're going to accept it, especially because you're not going to lose anything for doing so because if they don't accept it, you get it back. It goes back into your change tip wallet. Yeah. So I guess if we were to take this guy completely seriously, um basically don't tip anyone uh <laughs> except for like the few people who I guess work out of misery and 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 loneliness and and like uh people who people who traditionally got tipped in the old economy servers and waitresses um don't tip rich people don't tip people who have regular jobs don't professors. show appreciation for anything at all yeah yeah don't tip people who are kind to you okay these are just these are just dumb <laughs> i don't know like I, that whole that whole section should honestly be deleted from the article <laughs> Because it's all, it's really just pointless rules, and it kind of detracts away from the other decent points about about change tip not really being profitable and the, whether where it's going in the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, trying to dictate what people should and shouldn't do with their five dollars of of tipping money, kind of pointless. But yeah, I think we kind of kind of covered that uh, article and and uh, countered those arguments. Um, so uh, something that else that we wanted to talk about uh, is the comic book about Bitcoin called The Hunt for Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, which has gotten some traction recently. It got some crowdfunding to like translate it into English. Um, and uh, yeah, like this is the first like full-fledged Bitcoin comic that was created by writers and artists that focuses on like a, a story um, about trying to find out who Satoshi Nakamoto is. And it goes into subjects like hacking and, and uh, cybersecurity and um, like dark net and, and things like that. Um, so is this like a kind of a, is this like the first example of like a full-fledged like creative work being funded in whole uh, by like decentralized currency, and uh, what like what implication does this have for like crowdfunding art in the future and, uh, and like future comic books and stuff? It, it was it was crowd crowdfunded. I I don't know if it was crowdfunded by Bitcoin or any kind of cryptocurrency though. Oh. 
So, but the the comic book is about this guy. What I think his name, his last name is Galt, which is a reference to Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Uh. Who is John? Robert Galt or Bob Galt or something like that. And I guess he goes on a hunt to try to find the true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto. And he goes on an adventure through the seedy underbelly of the digital cypherpunk world. Huh. And uh, it's the significance of this comic book is that it's being marketed to the mainstream. I, th- I think mm. it, it got sold. It's, it's being sold out of from a uh, like a pretty a pretty big uh, comic book publisher in in Madrid, Spain. I can't I don't remember exactly what it's called, but it's a, like a pretty mainstream, well known comic book publisher. So it's it's being marketed towards people outside of the cryptocurrency community. Okay. Okay. But it also is heavily focused around crypto things about like you said cryptography and hacking dark nets dark net markets things like that mm. and uh actually one of the writers for bitcoinus.net recently has done an interview with one of the creators of the comic i i can't say too much about it because the article's not published yet but oh. uh one of the ideas that this creator uh, highlighted and identified to the uh, interviewer was that the comic book is has lots and lots of references to cryptography and cryptocurrency. So, so it's, it's kind it's, of like an educational aspect yeah. as well. So since it has all these references and it's being marketed towards the mainstream, that's exactly it's it's an educational opportunity for. Uh, especially kids, since it's a comic book, but for mm. mainstream as a whole. So it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah. It was recently released in English. I think that's what the crowdfunding was for, so they could get funds to translate it. So, yeah, it's it's available on the website. I, unfortunately, I can't remember what, the, what that website is. But yeah, yeah. People can just Google um, The Hunt for yeah. Satoshi Nakamoto comic book. And yeah, they've got like... It's it's printed. It's like hardbound, you know, hardcover bound. Um, pretty pretty legit. Should introduce uh, a lot of people um, to the concepts of cryptography, cryptocurrency, cybersecurity, things like that. So yeah, um, pretty cool. Pretty cool. I might I might order myself a copy of that. Um, so a- another another big topic that we wanted to kind of touch on was uh, a new altcoin that kind of came out um, called Paycoin. Uh, it's made by a company called Ga Miners, who used to uh, sell mining equipment, hardware, for mining cryptocurrencies, um, especially script machines. But then they transferred to cloud mining, uh, and then they kind of switched gears again and started moving towards this whole uh, Paycoin alternative cryptocurrency system, and uh, there, it basically, it's a, it's a company that's there's a lot of controversy around them. A lot of people think that they are uh, kind of a pyramid scheme type of business, uh, kind of with the cloud hashing thing, especially people basically pay into them and they get a quote for how much hashing power they've bought into. And uh, Ga Miners kind of promises them that they'll get a certain amount of return over a certain um, amount of months. And uh, as they've kind of transitioned into the Paycoin thing, uh, people can exchange their hashing shares for Paycoins. So that's been a criticism as well. So like, oh, these people haven't profited enough from their hashing shares yet. Oh, but you can just exchange that for this new altcoin, Paycoin and profit from that instead so it's kind of like oh is that a little bit of a ponzi aspect um we don't know uh there's a lot of questions right now around ga miners it's not exactly clear they've made a lot of promises about paycoin they've said that they're they've had agreements with major retailers like walmart 
uh, to implement Paycoin as a as a payment system and kind of leapfrog over Bitcoin, leapfrog over BitPay, and uh, basically get this payment system as widely accepted. Um, and one of one of the weird things they also did was. Um, when Paycoin was, even before Paycoin was released, they promised that the price would stabilize at $20. And it kind of released, and it was over $20 for a little bit, but then it dropped down to $6. And um, that was last week, and since then, it's kind of went up a little bit, up to $10. And uh, I guess they're promising people, like, hey, buy Paycoins, and your money will double, basically, because we're going to shore up the price at $20. Um, do you think that's kind of? Do you think that's possible? Is that legitimate that they can like have have reserves on hand to either pump up the the price of their own coin, or maybe limit the supply so that there's more demand for the existing coins and the price goes up to twenty dollars? I don't know like how they're really promising that. It's possible as long as they have the funds to do it. Mm-hmm. I'm still going through the white paper for Paycoin. Uh, because I really, I really want to understand it. So I'm not exactly sure how they're going to turn this into something profitable for the actual company. So if if they're not doing mining anymore, which I'm sure they're going to keep doing mining for a while, because uh, that's their main source of profit. But if, as long as they're doing that and they're making money from that, then they'll have the funds to shore up the price. Mm. Mm-hmm. But they're doing that for the sake of stability because they also have they also have a scheme to manipulate the supply to increase it to go along with demand so it doesn't go up too fast and this is all for the for the sake of stability because they believe that keeping a stable price will encourage mainstream investors to get in because yeah. there won't be a risk of it of it going down by 50% overnight but I don't really see the point in doing that because it's that that twenty dollar coin is not really backed by real demand at that point if you have to constantly pump money into it at a loss just to keep it at a yeah. just to keep the price at a certain level. And that increases so, centralization as well, as you're trying to use yeah, centralized means of manipulating the price of a currency that you your own company created actually the one one of the suspicions around this whole pay coin thing is it's entirely centralized really because i think i think some aspect of the wallets maybe not the actual wallets themselves that you'll have on your computer but some aspect of the network it is it, not decentralized it's uh, proprietary owned by gall miners so that's one of the controversies kind of mm. more controversial shady shady things surrounding it but yeah it's it's definitely interesting I, I, i'm kind of curious to see how it's going to turn out uh my initial reaction to it was well i noticed that they were going to be it wasn't going to be a fixed supply they're going to be steadily increasing it for the sake of stabilizing the price but uh the in the white paper they describe how they're going to do that yeah. and they don't actually have a way to decrease the supply which is a big problem because at some point undoubtedly inevitably that's going to lead to a point uh where there is massive depreciation because it's i just don't see how it wouldn't happen that demand would dr- point where the supply would actually have to decrease to keep the price stable Mm -hmm. uh, because it would be just the exact opposite of increasing the price along with demand to keep it stable but since they don't actually have a way to do that they can only increase the supply yeah the number the number of coins is just going to go up and up and up and then once demand drops to a point where the supply has to decrease they can't do that and there's just going to be huge surplus and then the value is really going to go down that's one of the first things i noticed and another thing is that this is actually a proof of work proof of stake hybrid yeah so there's a there's a a proof of work stage where the coins are actually mined 
And after after a certain point, it switches over to proof of stake, and you start earning an uh, an interest rate on. Yeah, and that's based... already happened, by the way. Um, Coindesk put out an article on this, the whole PayCoin launch on December 18th, and that article mentioned that uh, the proof of work phase was going to go on for another 48 hours after that date. So basically, it's been in proof of stake phase since the 20th of December. So it's a couple days now. So basically, no one can mine the currency anymore. And um, the people who have the currency, you basically have to let it sit in a wallet and don't touch it for 30 days. And then after that 30-day mm -hmm. mark, uh, the proof of stake kicks in and you start earning interest basically on your coins that you're just holding and not transacting. So I think part of the scheme is that if they can get people to not spend it and like not sell their holdings um, for the next 30 days, then the price should go up to $20. That's what they're kind of hoping. And that All depends right. on people not touching their coins uh, based on the incentive that they're going to earn interest in 30 days by just holding PayCoin, basically. But then doesn't that kind of go against the whole idea of it being a payment system? Like at some point, people are going to actually want to spend it and use the money at Walmart or wh whoever they're promising is going to accept this PayCoin. Uh, it seems kind of like, like a contradictory scheme a little bit. I don't know how it's going to play out over the next couple months. Yeah, I I don't either, and and also to to add to that, if if you once you move your coins, if if you move them to another wallet, that thirty day period starts over again, and you have to wait another thirty days to earn interest. Yeah. So, it, it I I really think it just it just goes back to demand. Uh, people people are going to spend it if if they want to, if they want to spend it if there's anywhere that accepts it I, I think they said they already have deals with lots of merchants to accept it i'm not yeah. sure about that but then the problem with but that I, aspect of the story as well is uh coinfire.cf came out with an article where they investigated those claims actually contacted uh walmart and a couple of other other retailers and they said that we have no affiliation with gone miners <laughs> Uh, we have no partnership with them to accept this cryptocurrency, and um, any claims otherwise are kind of just uh, BS or speculatory or maybe just still in the works. But I don't know; it's not definitive, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't really thought about that um, aspect of it too much. How how they're going to how people are going to actually use it if there's a huge and such a huge incentive to not use it. Mm. So I, I don't, I don't really have anything to say about that because I haven't thought about it too much. But if that is, if that is how they're planning on keeping it at, at $20 a coin, I don't, that, that's definitely not the best solution. And it's really, it's, it's only temporary best case. If, 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 if there's actually anywhere that does accept it and people want to buy things, they're they're going to do it if their if their time preferences are aligned in a way to where they would rather spend it than save it and earn the interest on it. So I don't, but you know I don't want to get too much into it because like I said I I'm not done reading the white paper yet so I don't understand exactly how it works and I haven't thought about that too much yet because I've been focusing on the whole uh, supply elasticity. Yeah. deal going on there and that's probably the most interesting part because that's the technical details about how this thing is actually going to behave in the market and what mechanisms they might try and implement or put in place to manipulate the price um overall i don't i don't really like the idea it seems to a little bit too shady um there's definitely enough altcoins on the market already uh <laughs> we it's it, there's nothing really revolutionary about it about paycoin um it's just a it's it's the business venture of ga miners yep. they're hoping to gain a foothold with this uh with retailers and basically implement this as a non-volatile altcoin um i yeah i don't know i don't know i'm still in um, favor of bitcoin do you know do you know how people got the right to mine it during the proof of work phase? Did they trade their 
their uh, sh- their mining shares for it. I um I think that was an aspect. Uh, so people had, like had these things called hash points that they collected, which are like the mining shares, and they could trade that in. But um, I'm not sure if there was uh, a way for just a an average person who wasn't a part of the whole GAM miners ecosystem yet to like jump in and start mining Paycoin. Um, but either way, it's, it's too late now. The proof of work is already over. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's what I was kind of getting at. Uh, was that there wasn't really a way for the average person to, to get in on it because the the rights to mine it were, are proprietary. Because mm-hmm. with, with Bitcoin, when, when Bitcoin first started, anybody with a laptop could download the client and start mining it. But it, it seems like with Paycoin, and again, I don't fully understand how it works, so I could be totally mistaken about this, but it seems to me, based on what I understand so far, is that you have to you have to pay to play you have to you have to put forth some kind of payment to get mining rights or you had to during the proof of work stage and then based on how much you actually paid depends on how much you're able to mine maybe so so it kind of creates just this huge really uh centralized system of supply creation Players mine the most coins, so they're going to have the biggest supply going into the proof of stake phase. So their interest rate, the interest rate is going to give those people a lot more money, and then they're going to have a lot more control over the supply. And mm. that's all, all kinds of potentials for inflation there because it doesn't, it, it doesn't distribute the supply equally. So. Inflation works how it does when you get it through a central bank. I, I'm not getting really get into the economic details of it because that's to do with like quantity theory and all that. But it mm. seems like it's kind of unfair, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Mm. So I, I don't know. It's Gold Miners is definitely kind of a shady company. Nobody really likes them. So we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. I don't. Yeah. I, I if if. You want like my honest opinion, first impressions of it? I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Yeah, we'll, Looks. we'll keep and, an eye uh, on it for sure. Yeah, so it'll be fun to watch. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, so yeah, those are some of the biggest topics from the uh, past week um, in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, thank you guys for listening. This has been the Coin Brief Podcast number twenty-seven. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think about any of these topics. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like the video, uh, follow us on Twitter. Um, and yeah, we'll be back next week with some more news in the cryptocurrency space. Thank you guys for listening.